opportunities promised by the Constitution. Even their right to vote was subject to the veto of white sheriffs. The guns of racist power and the torches of the Ku Klux Klan continued to chain Negroes to lives of poverty and powerlessness. For tens of thousands of Negroes, the journey to a deceptive freedom had begun at the close of the Civil War. Instead of freedom, they found a cruel invention called Jim Crow. They were separated from their white fellow citizens from birth to death in schools, hospitals, and churches. For the black American, hurdles of inferior schools and outdated books had to be painfully cleared. be kept separate and segregated, provided they were separate but equal. As Charlie Drew scrambled over the barricades, he knew full well that separate but equal meant separate but unequal. Most black Americans were reminded every day of their lives that they were regarded by white society as second class. But Charlie Drew dreamed long thoughts. Even as his boy's body began to stretch and thicken into the frame of a fine athlete, he began to measure the hurdles that he would have to leap if he were to try to become a doctor. For Charlie, athletics were both a great challenge and a great opportunity to compete and to excel. When he graduated, his grades were good enough to win him acceptance at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Amherst still recalls Drew's great career that he carved out in the four years before his graduation in 1926. When Amherst awarded its Mossman Trophy at graduation to that student who had brought most honor to the school, it went to this black student who didn't know what second best meant. A winner of letters in five sports, an All-American mention in football, and an excellent scholar, Charlie Drew sighted down the track toward his final hurdle, medical school. In 1926, most black Americans did not dare dream of professional school. Racial quotas and inferior black schools built walls that hemmed them in. Even Charlie's school teacher mother, wishing to spare her son disappointment, had cautioned him. Charlie, don't dream too high. But Drew was a hurdler who considered hurdles a challenge. And now he used his athletic ability to make possible the medical career he was determined to have. He chose McGill University at Montreal, Canada a school known for its excellent medical education and its reputation for fairness to black students. This black American medical student seemed the embodiment of the Greek ideal, the joining of physical prowess with intellectual accomplishment. Drew excelled in learning even as he prevailed on the McGill playing field. 
It was at McGill that Drew's interest in the study of blood was awakened. That mysterious fluid that nourished life had a thousand secrets. But all men, he learned, shared a common blood. No man's skin was in any way related to the wondrous liquid that flowed steadily from every heart. At Montreal General Hospital, as an intern, Charles was often called upon to give blood transfusions. Too often, he witnessed the tragic results and the crude techniques used in moving blood from one human being to another. Lives slipped away as frantic doctors raced the clock, testing the blood of the patient, typing his blood, finding a donor whose blood could match that type, examining blood samples under the microscope. Time was the thief that killed. Drew determined that ways must be found to save those lives through stored blood. And the years of his residency were spent trying to unwind that secret. In 1936, pure research for a black doctor was unheard of. Sadly, he left Canada and research, returning to Washington as a teacher of pathology at Howard University. As Drew began to teach and serve as resident surgeon at Friedman's Hospital, the streets of Europe began to tremble. The whole world seemed poised at the edge of a pit. Charles Drew knew that if the world were to stumble into global war, millions of lives would be lost for want of blood. The frustrating riddle of successful blood storage on a mass scale was still unsolved. In 1938, the opportunity to seek those answers was given to the eager young surgeon, a two-year fellowship at Columbia for research and surgery at Presbyterian Hospital. Under the guidance of Dr. John Scudder, Drew launched the greatest program of systematic research into blood and medical history. Drew fought to solve the riddle of stored blood. Painstakingly, the data accumulated. The experimental animals were transfused. The agonizing months of observation inched by. Drew presented to Dr. Scudder a revolutionary proposal. For the first time, surgeons and scientists could combine their talents and run an experimental blood bank for human patients. Scudder was to be advisor of the laboratory experiments and the young black surgeon from Howard was made medical director of the entire project. The blood bank that was established set the pattern for all subsequent blood banks. A patient received the loan of blood and was responsible to repay the loan, two pints for every one received. The team worked around the clock, recording, testing, and evaluating safety measures and storage techniques by mid-1939, the last peaceful summer before World War II, Drew's team had performed a hundred transfusions without a fatality due to aged blood or incompatibility. Though death was being cheated, transfusions continued to cause violent reactions in the patients. To find the key to unlock their pain, Drew began an exploration into the mysterious world of plasma. To understand that journey, one must examine a single drop of blood. It is composed of four main elements. White cells, which can fight bacteria. Red cells that carry oxygen from the lungs. Platelets that assist in clotting the blood. And plasma, the fluid that suspends the blood cells. It was this fluid that Drew began to chart. For the first time, Controlled experiments were begun to find out how effective transfusions of plasma alone might be. Plasma contained every substance of whole blood except cells. Drew wondered if finally he had found the key. By summer's end, Drew and Scudder were driving their team toward absolute, truthful answers. 
On September 1st, 1939, bombs from German planes began to rain death upon the people of Poland. Total war exploded across Europe. A whole continent seemed to be bleeding. In New York City, half a world away, Charles Drew established a method to save the wounded. Plasma could save. He had proved it. Proved that plasma could be stored without refrigeration. Proved that plasma could be transfused immediately without the terrible loss of time for sampling and matching. Proved that in cases of shock, burns, and hemorrhages, red cells were not the part of the blood most necessary for recovery. At that critical moment, when blood was engulfing Europe, a black American surgeon had unlocked the door that was to mean life for millions. It was not until the Nazi Air Force hurled itself at the homes and factories of England that Drew's plasma began its mission of mercy. Blood for Britain was launched, and Charles Drew was appointed overall director of the program, demanding the most strict regulations for the preparation of the precious plasma. He had his first shipment flown to Britain in October 1940. By February 1941, Britain had adopted Drew's techniques and started its own successful blood bank program. As England held her ground, American factories raced to tool up, to build the plane, the guns, and the ships necessary to defend both England and America. In the titanic struggle for survival that seemed imminent, America would need blood as well as steel. One million pints of blood plasma had to be collected and prepared. At the age of 37, Drew was named medical director of the greatest blood program in history. Teams of technicians had to be recruited and trained. Blood banks spanning the continent had to be built and staffed. Exacting standards had to be established and enforced. Drew struggled to give the program birth, racing the moment when war would come to America. Japanese bombs shattered the peace of a Pearl Harbor Sunday. Of every 100 wounded men who were given plasma transfusions, 96 recovered. As a scientist, Drew knew that the master race theory of the Germans was utter nonsense. Hitler could boast of pure Aryan blood being superior to all others, but Drew knew from the test tubes that it was a lie. It was all chemically the same. Drew found that the American Red Cross, eager to find donors for the one million pints of blood necessary, allowed Jim Crow to move firmly into the collection centers. Orders from both the Army and the Navy demanded that the blood of Caucasians and Negroes be separated. Black soldiers, sailors, and airmen were fighting and dying on every battlefield to save American democracy but black men's blood was being segregated in the American blood program. Black donors who were eager to aid the life-saving program were being discouraged by the collection centers from volunteering or were being rudely rejected. Drew was furious. He summoned the press and issued a statement that made clear his disdain for the blood segregation order. As medical director of the National Blood Program, I have been asked my opinion of the practice of separating the blood of Caucasian and Negro donors. My opinion is not important. The fact is that test by race does not stand up in the laboratory. In 1941, America was not yet ready to examine its own racism. When the United States Army took over the blood bank program a month after Drew's press conference, he was released from the program. Drew returned to Harvard University to resume his teaching. There can never be a way of numbering the men, women, and children whose lives have been spared because this black hurdler had scaled the racial wall in America. Every six seconds in this country alone, a pint of blood is used in transfusion. 
Great as was the contribution that Drew made in the field of blood plasma, his unsung work as a teacher of surgery at Howard University may be just as great a legacy to us all. Drew's dedication inspired a generation of black doctors who studied under him to drive towards excellence and lives of public service. In April of 1950, while driving to a medical conference at Tuskegee, Alabama, Drew's car overturned in an accident near Burlington, North Carolina. Bleeding severely, he was rushed to the nearest hospital, which was white and segregated. Even plasma could not save him. At age 46, Charles Drew was dead. It is ironic to note that Drew died only months before the Red Cross dropped the last traces of its segregated blood program. One will never know what other wonders this remarkable American might have given us in the battle against disease. He had run so hard, overcome so much, so fast. But one wishes that he had been spared enough time so that he could have seen the country he loved begin to move at last from the nightmare of superstition and racism that had cheated her of so many gifts from all her black children. Oh, me? No, you. Then, you out. You out. You out. Oh, what you mean? Oh, me? Yes, you got me. Then, you got me. Yes, you couldn't.